I've known Robin for a long time. He was um, the boyfriend of my very good friend, Claire. So that's how I know him. And then they parted company and then um, they went off their separate ways. Um, I wanted to clear, well, a little bit about Robin. Couldn't make a nicer guy. He's always worked really hard, had good jobs. Um, um, was uh, owned a couple of properties and then he met uh, Diana, his wife, uh, well, girlfriend, obviously, and they got married in 2003, I think, and they bought the post office because they wanted to sort of live and work together. So they became postmaster. Well, Diana was a sub postmistress. They bought this beautiful little place in Melsonby, North Yorkshire. And life was idyllic. Robin described it as being like living on a scene from Emmerdale. And it was a really busy village, and the post office was the, the hub of the village. They had a little shop inside the, the post office. And what I wanted to do was just sort of the beginning of the story was the first call that was ever made, which was Robin's emergency 999 call, which I thought would be um, interesting to listen to, but I can't find it, sorry. So, um, so um, that's the, the background uh, is, uh, is Robin, you know, it never had any convictions whatsoever, never even had a parking ticket. The police during the investigation gathered 500 statements about Robin's character, character witness statements, 500 in excess of, and not one person. They went right back to his primary school. Not, nobody said anything other than kind, generous things about this kind, generous man. Um, and then on the 23rd of March uh, in 2010, they were, uh, they, they were robbed. An armed, robbery, an armed robber came into the post office, and Diana was murdered in their upstairs living quarters. Um, Robin, was, Robin was arrested three weeks later and uh, arrested for her murder on, on circumstantial evidence. And then he was, trial wasn't until the following year, 2011, and on a 10-2 jury, so there was, uh, the, the um, judge, the, the jury couldn't make their minds up, and they couldn't get a full 12, so they, the judge said, we'll take a majority, which is what they did. They took a 10-2 jury, and Robin was convicted of murdering his wife on purely cir circumstantial evidence in the spring of 2011. Um, I'm, I'm referring to my notes like Terry was. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you style. <laughs> Keep looking at your bits of paper. Um, so the, so the, the main planks of the prosecution, there was just two main planks of the prosecution case. One was the time of death, um, the time of Diana's death. Um, Robin, didn't have an, Robin had an alibi from 4.30 in the morning, which is when he opened the shop up. He left Diana in bed, which was their usual routine. He came downstairs, he would open the shop up and they'd have the delivery men, the newspaper guys would come, the milkman would come. Um, and everything was normal, it was a normal day from 4.30. But what the time of death, they had, had a time of death, the prosecution had a time of death stomach contents expert who said that Diana had been killed specifically between 2.30 and 4.30 in the morning. Di Robin hadn't opened the shop until 4.30, so that kind of was, his alibi didn't begin until 4.30. Um, so time of death was that very specific, incredibly specific time. Um, and the other <laughs> plank of the prosecu prosecution case was that Robin had been, his motive for murder was he'd been stealing money from the post office and he didn't want Diana to find out, so he murdered her. That was, that was the crux of the story all based on circumstantial evidence. There was no forensic linking Robin to any of it, not the crime scene, not the murder weapon. Um, the murder weapon was uh, an iron bar, uh, about two foot long, I think it was. And it, was fa it wasn't found for two, two or three days, I think, uh, after the murder. The, um, and it was found on an eight, eight foot three inch wall, high wall, which is pretty high. Um, and it was, as Mike explained earlier on, it was, it was literally placed across the top of the wall, which is quite bizarre, really. It was as if it had been placed. Um, and what the prosecution said was that Robin had murdered Diana in the dead of night. He'd then gone downstairs. And we're talking about, say, if the post office door is over there, the wall was over here. It was right in proximity of the post office. So Robin has gone downstairs and placed the murder weapon on the wall in the dead of night. Then he's gone back in served all his customers and feigned happiness and normality uh, when in fact he'd actually just murdered his wife. Um, that was the prosecution case. Um, um, uh, so we are the stomach contents expert and we had the, um, the post office expert saying that he had his hands in the till. 
um, and it avoided audits. They had regular audits. Uh, post office did not have regular audits. The only time you'd have an audit actually was when a temporary sub-postmaster came in. If you were going on holiday, if you and your husband were going off on holiday for the weekend or a week, a temporary sub-postmaster would come in and then you would do. They call it an audit. Actually, it was just literally a, a, a Passover, a handover, like, you know, we'll make sure we've got the right amount of money here. You're saying that? Yeah, we're saying that. That was, a, that was, a, that was the sum of the audit. They said that the reason that Robin had been stealing money was he was, they had huge debts. That, again, was circumstantial. Um, I'll just read something here that Robin wrote that um, for, regarding his finances. They said that he was in, they'd gone on expensive holidays and most, most were to, North, uh, to uh, Northumberland, but and they were living beyond their means. They had quite a good income. They didn't have any children. Robin had quite a bit of money from, from when he'd owned the previous properties. But to put it in perspective, when they bought the, the post office seven years before this incident, at £153,000, they took a loan out of £95,000, um, which wasn't deemed ex ex excessive. And yet seven years later, uh, they'd only increased the debt by £13,000, and the property was now worth £450,000. So it only, it only, you know, in over seven years, it only borrowed another thirteen thousand pounds, but in the the uh, prosecution case, uh, used that and said it was strong circumstantial evidence to suggest that they were in huge debt, and uh, and that's why he had his hands in the till. Um, so the um, the the what's wrong with all this? Um, the Robin had an alibi from four thirty because of all the. They served, they served in excess of 70 customers from 4.30 in the morning. So from 4.30 in the morning, chances are he couldn't have done or harmed anybody. He was in the post office working, serving his customers. Um, and um, at court, also on the murder weapon, there's no DNA of Robbins on it. However, there is DNA of a police officer. Um, well, um, but so in the courtroom, the, this time of death stomach contents expert uh, he's adamant that Diana's been killed between 2.30 and 4.30. Um, and in the courtroom, uh, Robin had said that he'd heard Diana call to him at 6.45, so she couldn't have been dead at 4.30 because he'd heard a shout to him. There's also a very reliable witness who also said he heard Diana from the back of the shop call to Robin at 6.45. And this witness went straight to the police as soon as all this kicked off. The, you know, the police arrived on that day. Uh, this reliable witness went to the police and said, I, I heard her, I heard Robin's, well, I heard a woman call to Robin from the back of the shop. It can only have been Diana. So in the courtroom, we have the time of death ex ex so-called stomach contents expert who's saying Diana was dead by 4.30. And we also have this witness saying, but hang on a minute, I heard, I heard this woman call from the back of the shop at 6.45. And uh, in the courtroom, they said to this witness, look, we're not saying you're lying. We're saying you must be mistaken because here we have this reliable stomach contents expert who's saying Diana was dead by 4.30. So they were pitched against each other in the court and clearly the jury decided the stomach contents expert was more reliable than the witness. Um, so um, jump forward a little bit after the trial. Obviously Robin's convicted, so all this comes post-trial. The stomach contents expert... Um, it's discovered that she contradicts herself in a case only a year later, another murder case, and she, she gets all her evidence, she contradict, contradicts her scientific evidence, and um, it's all called into question, and it's proven that she has got a science completely wrong, that the, 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 book, the scientific book she's working from in the courtroom is written by a guy called Dr Rouse, and Robin contacts Dr Rouse and puts this case to him about the time of death, who says stomach contents can never be seen as a reliable not that tight. You can't ever say that uh, stomach contents can be seen as a reliable timing for, for time of death. And he said she's got all the science wrong. Uh, you, you know, she, this, this quite potentially, you know, possible that Diana was still alive shortly before she was found at 8.30 in the morning. Um, that's all happened since trial. So that stomach contents expert has now gone. She's no longer there. The CCRC accepts that she's probably gone. That evidence is gone, but they've never returned back to Mr. You know the, the reliable witness who heard Diana call at six forty-five in the morning. Um, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit lost now. <laughs> There's so much. Um, uh, so, so the new evidence since trial is 
that the stomach contents expert has gone. That's new evidence. It's new and it's fresh. It wasn't available at trial. Um, also, the DNA, there's a police officer involved. When, the, when they found the murder weapon, which wasn't found for two or three days after the, after the murder happened, there's a, on the DNA, on the, on the murder weapon, there's DNA of a police officer. Now, it was explained away by they said, oh, the police officer must have talked near it, spat near it, you know, not spat, but his, you know, saliva's come from his mouth, and that's how they explained away the DNA. However, the other, the, 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 the um, addition to that is that in the murder, in the crime scene, which was upstairs in the post office, this, this particular police officer had never been in the crime scene. He never went in the building. He actually wasn't on duty on the 23rd of March, the day of the crime, the day of the murder. Um, so he doesn't, he never enters the building at all. He's off duty. But somehow his DNA has managed to get on the pillow where Diana was felled. She's killed on this pillow in the bed. Um, and uh, we've tried to find out why, how this police officer's DNA, which is all, again, it's all new evidence. It's all come about since the trial. How this police officer's DNA has managed to land itself on the, same, on the crime scene where Diana was killed. Um, and... Uh, I mean, basically, there's more evidence on this police officer because it's forensic evidence than there ever was on Robin. There's been, there's no, it's all circumstantial on Robin. Um, also, at the crime scene, um, there is the DNA of three. Uh, it's a mixed DNA of three males on this on the on the pillowcase where Diana was killed. Um, there's also in the unused evidence, uh, um, evid uh, well not evidence, it's factual that there was three known criminals in the village of Melsonby on the morning of the murder of the 23rd of March. Um, there's also a Crime Stoppers report came in um, about naming, uh, 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 um, naming somebody, a known criminal, and said he, was at the, he, he did it, he, he committed this crime. Um, nobody ever investigated that, that wasn't investigated. Um, and um, um, there was also, um, Robin always said that the man who came into the post office, who came into the post office and said, he, had a, he was wearing a mask and he had a gun and he said to Robin, don't do anything stupid with what your wife. Now, later that day or the following day, there was a BB gun, which is called a ball bearing gun, like a pretend gun was found with a mask about nine miles away from the post office. The Cleveland police found it and it's never been tested for forensics. It's never been tested for DNA. It's just in a cupboard somewhere in this, uh, at the North Yorkshire Police. No, nobody's ever tested it. It's just seen as a bit of a coincidence that there was a BB gun and a mask found. Um, the uh, prosecution said there was large amounts of cash found on Robin the day of the murder. The large amounts of cash was 450 pound he had in his pocket from the nights before take, takings from the, from the shop. Um, this, and there's so much more. I could, we could, I could fill the day like, like Terry was saying. You could fill the whole day with evidence that all you know supports innocence. It's just overwhelming. Um, so um, the the new evidence certainly is the fact that the, the time of death expert has been discredited, and uh, so you know meaning that, Al, that the, uh, Diana was quite probably murdered shortly before she was found, meaning Robin couldn't have done it if she was murdered after 4.30 in the morning. After 4.30 in the morning, it couldn't have been Robin. That's new evidence. The, uh, the DNA of the police officer at the crime scene is new evidence. Also, the other... Sorry. It's all right. Was she killed at half past four in the morning when everybody's asleep? No, she was where the, the defense store, Robin always remained saying that he left her in bed at 4.30. When he got up to go downstairs at 4.30, he left Diana safe and asleep in bed and very much alive. He's gone downstairs, opened his shop, and continued his business. Just worked in the shop, sorry, maybe missed the important bits out of the story. He's worked in the shop, serving all his customers, normal morning, nothing unusual at all. At 8.30 he goes into his little, because the post office is within, the post office little counter is within the shop, the little village shop. He's gone into his, uh, the village, and, and the, also the other important thing um, is that the, Post office safes are on a, on a central timer. You can't open your post office safe until everybody opens the post office safe. You can't override that. Robin's gone into the post office to get some stamps. It's half past eight, so he can open the safe. As he opens the safe, a gun, uh, uh, an armed man comes into the room with a gun, says, we've got your wife. Don't do anything stupid. So Robin fills his, he has a bag. Robin fills the bag with the £16,000 from the safe and the contents of the till. The guy goes out of the door, Robin hears him, shuts out, go out the back door, and then he runs upstairs straight away to Diana, and he finds Diana on the bed, um, face down, with blood all over her head. He'd already killed her. 
She was already dead. But he said, if you don't give me money, she'll we, kill me. Yeah. Right. If, if you, we, we, so, was it DNA found on the bar, the DNA on the pillar, who one of the same yes. police officer yes. who, who, who was on duty? It wasn't on no. duty. No. And he's never been able to come up with an alibi. Has it been interviewed? He gave about nine statements. And all of them are very weird. I wish Mike, Mike was here, actually. He gave a very weird statement. He'd, he'd been using the same gloves since 1998, leather gloves he'd been wearing. But he, his statements are all over the shop when you read his statements. So he, and his DNA is on the murder weapon, which wasn't found for two days, and it's on the bed, yeah. Um, I mean, and he wasn't on duty. He was off. He's never come up with an alibi. We've never seen an alibi. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I missed important parts of the story out there. It's quite nerve-wracking up here. But yeah, so, so Robin runs upstairs, finds Diana on the bed, and uh, he rings 999, which is what I wanted to listen, let you listen to. That is the right video. Say that again. No, I don't yeah, know what it, I don't know what it is. Video. Is it? It's online. Oh, have you? I'm new to my music. Where's it say on there? No. Oh, is it over here? Yeah, he's there, just give it there. So if you start, start it from the beginning again. So, so this is, this is instantly after this has happened, Robin goes... Can't hear it, can you? So that, that's instantly, obviously, that's the 999 call that starts the ball rolling for everything, and then the police come. And uh, uh, yeah, um, so that we, so there's, so there's, there's, there's just an incredible amount of evidence supporting Robin's innocence. That this, this, this was just, this was a, a robbery. Uh, there had been robbed in 2009 as well, an armed robbery. Post offices were always getting robbed, and there were, if you saw the location of the village shop where the, the, the village is in Melsonby, it's just perfect to be stalked or watched or from as far. It's right in the middle, and you could sit at four roads, and it's right on the edge of a motorway, so you get away so quickly. Um, and um, uh, so, so they were robbed in 2009, and they nearly sold up. Robin wanted, right, really frightened Robin, and he said, ironically, when this happened in 2010. And when this guy walked in and said what he said, he said, I wasn't fearful at all. I just kept thinking, let me get to Diana, let me get to Diana. And of course, he's run, up, he's run upstairs and found what he found. Um, but, um, so what happened on the first appeal? What did the appeal cause? So the first appeal, thank you, Sean. The first appeal, so what happened was the, 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 the prosecution said that Robin's motive for murder was he's been stealing from the, his own post office. It's his own post office, but he'd been stealing. And they said that they, was, they, they could see from the books, they thought, the post office experts, this is, they could see from, their, from the records that they felt that, that there was um, evidence, but although not specific evidence, just overall evidence that their view was, there's, you know, there's, be, there's some of transactions that are a bit dodgy. Um, but they could only take, they, they, they only had the records for like the last eight months. They said the records previous, for, for way, way back from when they first took over the post office to make a comparison, didn't exist. Robin's convicted. After trial, it's discovered that those records did exist, they do exist, and they were able to show that they always kept the books the same way. There was nothing suspicious about the way they kept the books, and they'd had several audits in between. So had they been, the, the audits would have flagged up anything suspicious about their bookkeeping, but it didn't because there wasn't. So they took that to the um, appeal courts, and they were convinced that would be that would be it. It would just show the non-disclosure of the post office evidence and it would throw the post office evidence out. However, the judges said, no, we don't think that's pretty relevant. We think what the judges, the jury convicted on was time of death. 
that Diana was killed before, Diana, before Robin opened the shop at 4.30. So everything was then concentrated on the time of death, which also now has since gone. It's gone. The, the woman who said that Diana was killed at 4.30, her evidence has been discredited, she's been discredited, and there's every chance that Diana was still alive up until either minutes, or even if she was alive at 6.30. Robin had an alibi from 4.30. And when you see in the CCRC statement of reasons, they kind of bring that in and say, well, somebody else said she could still have been alive at 6.30. Well, if, if, if Diana was, you know, Robin was uh, in the shop from 4.30, he couldn't have killed her after 4.30. And the evidence shows that she was very likely killed even an hour, even if it was two hours before, that takes us to 6.30. And we have this reliable witness who heard Diana call out to Robin at 6.45 in the morning, along with Robin heard her as well. This has all been put to the CCRC. I think there's been two or three applications. Um, and every single professional, there's been many professionals, scientists. One scientist said to us, a DNA expert said, when I look at all the evidence and I look at all the DNA, Robin Garment's not on any of it. It's not on the murder weapon. It's not at the crime scene. The, you know, you can't possibly wipe his DNA off and leave everyone else's there. You can't do it. It's like, Excuse me. sorry. Um, and he said, when I, look at the, when I look at the DNA, Robin Garbutt's not in any of it. He, 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 you know, he can't possibly be involved. Have you ever seen the report of Diane's uh, medical report, the forensic report, for example, uh, the temperature yeah. of the body? Yeah, yeah, all of it, yeah. So, yeah. because of temperature, like... Because it's what, sorry? The temperature of the body of the yeah. body. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the post-mortem didn't happen until 2.30 in the afternoon. So Diana was found at 8.30, and the paramedics came... And uh, they, in their opinion, they said that to Robin, she's been down a while, mate. That's, that's what they said. And they said there was a hypostasis and there was p potentially some rigor mortis setting in. But uh, when, you look, when you talk to other scientists, they'll say that they're not a good indicator of time of death. And even the CCRC, when, when John, you once gave a, um, at one of the conferences uh, um, a discussion about exceptional circumstances, and you talked about time of death, you can't be specific about time of death. Uh, it can be, like, when, the, when Suzanne Dando was uh, murdered, the woman who made the 999 call who said, I've just found Suzanne Dando dead. You know, she'd been, they were talking minutes after she'd been dead. In the 999 call, she talks about Suzanne Dando being blue. Well, some people would look at that indicator as she's been dead a while because she's turning blue, but a lot of the, there's not, not many indicators of death that would give you a specific time and food contents is definitely not one of them. Even rigor mortis, me and you both died. We might, it might happen at different times. And also, there was good, good evidence to suggest that um, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called cad, cad, cadaveric spasm. It's good, easy for me to say. Cadaveric spasm. And it can happen when somebody dies in the throes of terror, or if you were running up a mountain and you died, you can actually die in the position you die because the, your, adrenal, your body's filled with adren adrenaline. And you, there, are, there is, if you do it, if you Google it, there are sp occasions where people have been died with a gun, literally a gun or a knife in the hand and the hand stays where it is. And we have a, a, somebody who said that, that you know, Diana, while they're trying to say Diana's hand was stiff, that she could have rigor mortis, it can be much quicker when you are putting up a fight. And also another very important thing I forgot to mention was that on the crime scene, there was a clump of hair found at the side of Diana's hand, body, where her hand would have been, which has obviously come out in a fight. There's obviously been a scrap. And, and this, you can see on the crime scene photographs, this clump of hair, and it's fairly medium of brown, and it's fairly long, as in medium length hair. Robin's hair was very, very short and gray. Pardon? It's not his hair. It's not, it's not Diana's hair, it's not, Brian, it's not Robin's hair. But it's been, but it was lost. It wasn't. Surely not. Yeah. Yeah, it was lost. Diane had long brown hair. And the DNA on the car? Yeah, the Oh, we don't. No, I think he. I'm not sure. I don't know. Was he ever involved in the inquiry of the officer? Was DNA in the bar? Was he ever involved in the inquiry? He was at trial giving evidence to say that he found the. He was involved in the finding of the murder weapon. He, well, he didn't. It was a, an officer called Greg, somebody or other, who actually... He, so the, a police officer's found it, they've yeah. bagged it, apparently, and it's gone away to whatever, to wherever. And, and Thompson said, well, I was there, but I don't know who was on duty with me, but I was there, I did see it being found, and I must have spat on it, I must have... Because initially they said the DNA of this full male 
DNA profile was the DNA of the wielder. Because the other strange thing about the, the pipe when it was found was it's overhanging a wall, so this is the wall. So whoever's placed it at this side, that you'd think the DNA would be at this side, but it was actually on the other side. The other side of the wall dropped down to a three foot drop. The, the land rose up. It was a private garage at the other side. So not, not a public place at all. Um, so the, but his DNA was on the other side of the wall. So whoever's placed it. But what they tried to say was Robin had done it in the dead of night, thrown it, placed it on the wall. And it's kind of like, if he had done, if he was guilty, why the hell would you go and place them? You know, it didn't make any sense at all. But they, but they said that, well, it wouldn't make any sense for, a, the, you know, the so-called criminals to do it either. But, so this has all gone before the CCRC um, several times now um, and as, as, as new evidence. But the CCRC, they say things like, they say things like, sorry, I'm going to get me my bit of paper. What do they say things like? <laughs> They, right, they see, there's some TV footage of the, foot, of, the, of the wall taken the day after or the day of the murder. You can't see the, the bar on the wall. You should be able to see the bar on the wall if it's there. So there's some TV footage from Tyne Tees. The CCRC is saying, we don't see any merit in looking any further into that. They don't see any merit into looking further into Thompson, the police officer whose DNA is at the crime scene and on the, mur on the murder weapon. They don't see any merit into investigating that. Investigating that. The post office, I'm sure you all must have come across or heard about the sub-postmasters cases. All these sub-postmasters have been wrongfully convicted. I think 555 or maybe 700, it's massive, it's huge. The same people who are giving evidence against all those sub-postmasters have also given evidence, they were, one of them was in court giving evidence against Robin. So the same investigating officers have conducted the same investigation against Robin and also been involved in some of the quash cases. The CCRC don't seem any merit in looking at that either. So we have all this evidence that there's so much to go at, but the CCRC don't think there's any merit in looking at it. It's just, we've, we've seemed to have been in this battle with, the, the, Robin was convicted in 2011, and then he's been in battle with the CCRC since 2015, and it never ends. And it's like, it's like dealing with fog, because it just moves around. You've got all these facts that nobody wants to listen to. And every single expert, from the likes of Dr. Norton, to private investigators, to scientists, to um, um, ba three barristers, solicitors, uh, all saying the same thing, that if you don't see innocence, you have to recognise there's doubt. And it should go back before the Court of Appeal for the Court of Appeal to decide. But the CCRC says it doesn't pass the real possibility test. And I, we've said, if this doesn't pass the real possibility test, what will? Nothing can, if Robin, Robin Garbett's case, along with Clive's and along with Jeremy Bamber's potentially, if these cases don't get through, nobody's going to get through because they're not meant to get through. And, and it feels heartbreaking. And when I watch Robin's mum, who's now 80, she was 68 when all this happened. She's now an 80 year old lady, very poorly, got a bad heart. And they've coped with such dignity, haven't they? You know, Robin's such a dignified man, they don't, you know, the, 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 I think Michael asked me about what the, what the impact on the family. The impact, it goes without saying what the impact is. It goes without saying. They travel every week to see him. We've had all the lockdown where they went all that time not being able to see each other and all for an innocent man. Clive Freeman, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what that's what that's what Dr. Norton always says that while we've locked, while we've got Robin locked up, the person who actually did murder Diana, and the evidence the evidence saying the evidence I mean, there's lots of unused evidence that that, that, that a poor defence. I mean, the, uh, the CCRC wants to do um, a presentation that I was at, and they named seven exceptional circumstances where they would refer. Robin takes five of those. In depth, five of them. The two he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't uh, qualify was one was to do with sentence and one was to do with interfering with witnesses. The other five to do with forensics. And Robin ticks them all. And Mike Norton and I were at a conference, and my, the hair on my neck, on the back of my neck, went up. And I read. I thought, "You're talking about Robin Garbutt's case. He ticks five of those exceptional circumstances when they say they refer." But you know, all, all this is new, or a lot of this is new, a lot of it is fresh. We can't get through them. 